Hi, everybody, and welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. Delighted on this episode to be talking with someone who I believe has podcasted before. I see the microphone, the, <laughs> the headgear, all of the things. I, I think this is probably uh, not Maggie Takuda Hall's first time doing this. Is that right? That's true. I actually keep a podcast with a close friend of mine called Failure to Adapt. That's about um, book to film adaptations. Oh, I love it. I love it. And are they <laughs> technically failed adaptations? Is that? Uh, no, fail, failure to adapt is actually a military term for being unable to uh, like meet the high demands of the military. Like, oh, culturally. nice, nice. Uh-huh. Um, and we just thought it was funny. Sometimes it's a failure to adapt. Like sometimes they're very bad movies made from mm-hmm. very good mm-hmm. books. Um, but we've also read some really terrible books that have made really great movies. So it can go either that. way. I love how that works. I, I'm also a film <laughs> fan, so I will have to check it out and was not aware that you were in the world of podcasting. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. mostly just for fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As, as is this, I'm a teacher by day, so this is just uh, promoting literacy and sharing about books. I think the first book of yours that I came across was Squad, uh, being a comics reader, comics fan, net galley follower, and, and all of those sort of things. Um, and from there, I, I had no idea, uh, but you, you've done picture books, you've done mm-hmm. prose novels, uh, you have a really nice wide range of material that you've shared with the world already. And a oh, podcast. Thank you. That's really kind. And a yeah. podcast. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Yeah, I, I love mm-hmm. to see that kind of range of telling stories across media and for a variety of audiences, too. I do too. I love it when authors are kind of all over the place. Like I know it's a better decision, like business decision to have a brand and be really specific. Like I write contemporary YA romances or whatever, Mm -hmm, and all the mm -hmm. books can be packaged similarly. So your readers know how to find you. It makes a ton of sense. Um, But I, I love an author who just does whatever is exciting to them. Cause I feel like that kind of passion is apparent in the prose and in the work. Yeah, And that's definitely the way I approach my own. Yeah, I love that. I love that as well. Um, So what drew you into the world of authoring, creating Mm -hmm. uh, the written word? I come from a family of storytellers. I'm the only person who's a writer writer, like for books. Um, Mm -hmm. I have TV writers in my family. I have a lot of TV people. I have a journalist. My mother was a journalist. Uh, My father was a journalist before he became um, a reality TV person. My sister works in reality television. Um, But beyond that, just like everyone in our family is a really good storyteller. And so the way that we would relate to each other was by telling stories. And when we all get together, that's sort of how it is, is everybody is sort of uh, competing with the many stories going on at any given moment (laughs) at a table, like in a family conversation. And, um, And so I just grew up immersed with you know, telling stories, telling jokes, and that being a fundamental way that I understood the world and the people around me. And some of that's down to being Jewish. And some of that's just down to being in a family full of people who don't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> that's, it's, it's a gift, right? It's a gift yeah. of storytelling. Yeah. yeah. So, so everyone else in the family was going mm-hmm. in the direction of television, journalism, mm-hmm. other things. And you said, I like it, but no, I'm going to try out this, <laughs> this other thing. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I think it might have been more financially viable to go into the television route, although I guess <laughs> the, the current strikes beg to differ. Um, mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. Uh, I studied studio art in college. Like I loved to paint and to make things. Um But even when I was doing that, I realized what I was really most interested in was the opportunity to tell a story. And that, in fact, uh, my writing was much better than my visual art ever was. Um, And so I had gotten a job as a children's bookseller, like right out of college. I think I'd been I'd graduated like two weeks earlier and I um, got a job as a children's bookseller and like just fell in love, like absolutely fell in love. And I didn't realize how many of my formative memories were around books until Mm -hmm. I started selling them and realizing I had all these incredibly personal connections to so many stories. And so many of them are still in print. And some of them we had to bring in special to my store because I was like, Hey, wait, is this still in print? Is that still in print? And I just, uh, 
like absolutely just like got set on fire by it. And I have never looked back. Like I just really love children's literature a lot. And I am so excited and proud to be a part of it because I had been on the selling side of it for so long. Like I was a children's bookseller for about a decade. Mm-hmm. And so um, I just, I love it too much to ever do anything else. Yeah, I, I get that. And you you had kind of a window in, in a way, as a seller mm-hmm. as well, to see what was on the market, to see what was out in the world, and to see reader reactions and interactions. Yes. Yeah, I had weekly conversations with the same kids, you know, that would have bought a book last Saturday, come in the next Saturday, and like, why did you like it? What was good? What was bad? What, you know, and it really, I think the most important thing that I learned as a bookseller is that no book will make everybody happy. Uh And that's Uh okay. It still does its job. (laughs) Yes, I've learned that as an English teacher, too. I've learned that there's not going to be one book that just settles the conversation. And that's why we need them all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so what is it like to work across comics, picture books, prose? Um, what's that like for you as the author? Invigorating, I would yeah. say. Is, uh, I think I had really wanted to write comics for a long time, but I was really intimidated by it. But I was really stalled out in prose projects that I'd been working on. And I met with a comics uh, artist named John Adams. He does like a lot of New Yorker cartoons. He's really funny, really dark. And we got lunch together. And my secret ulterior motive was to get him to teach me how to write comics. Uh And I was uh like, so are there like rules? Like, what do I have to do? He's like, oh, no, there's no rules. You just (laughs) do whatever you want. You just have to be consistent. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, I had no idea. Uh And it was so Uh exciting. And that's when I wrote Squad um, because I had that story and I wanted to write it. And I just didn't know if what I was doing was like allowed. Uh And so Uh I think what writing across different forms allows you to do is just like always feel fresh in a way. Like M.T. Anderson, who's one of my favorite authors, gives the advice that a change of pace is as good as a break when it comes to writing. And Uh so just being free to write whatever you want allows you to kind of chase the story down to its most essential parts, like the things that make it correct, like the things that give it its heft and its weight and its emotional resonance. And so not being confined to any one genre or style or form just makes that a lot easier and like a lot more fun and less, um, I would say like less arduous in certain ways and more arduous in other ways. <laughs> like <laughs> you have to do a lot of work to find what that right form is. And then once you do, the drafting becomes less arduous because it's in its correct form. And so it's going to flow more comfortably than when you're trying to shoehorn a prose story into a comic or a comic story into prose or whatever it is that you're struggling with. Yeah, yeah very cool. And also invigorating on the part of the reader to see someone work across forms, work with different ideas. And um, I'll mention The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea. Uh, I believe there's a second companion piece coming out in in, like weeks from now. Yes. In like two and a half weeks, The Siren, The Song, and The Spy comes out. And that's the sequel to The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea. Because I decided to give myself titles that would be really arduous to say constantly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. And I love the fantasy elements that you bring in. And um, there's kind of a, a Shakespearean kind of play with identity as well mm. that becomes part of that, um, which is wonderful to read and wonderful to explore. And uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the the fantasy approach and mm. the way of looking at the world through high creativity in that way. Um, so wanted to mention that as well and also give you the chance to to share anything that you would like to about the siren, the sea, and the spy. Uh the siren, the song, and the spy. It's the song, is... sorry, sorry. No, that's okay. It's, it's a lot of S's. It's a she sells seashells by the seashore kind of title. Um, um I mean, you know, I'm really excited about it. I had a ton of fun drafting it and um in The Mermaid, The Witch, and Sea, which is my very first novel that I've ever finished, um, I feel like uh, I was so serious in the way that I was sitting down to write it. And in some ways, that's a great strength. 
um, that kind of earnestness that I was coming at it with. And in The Siren, The Song, and The Spy, by the time I sat down to write it, I was just a much more confident and seasoned writer. And I mm -hmm. think that that is kind of evident in some of the pacing and the the way that the stories kind of come together ultimately. Um, but it has just like a lot of things that I'd always wanted to be in a book that was particularly mine. Um, and so I hope people enjoy it because I think it's for how uh, dark some of the material in both The Mermaid, The Witch and the Sea and Siren, The Song and the Spy is, I think The Siren offers a lot more levity to kind of balance it out. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping people enjoy that aspect of it as well. Love it, love it. And um, so as you're thinking about young readers, readers of all mm -hmm. ages, really, I like to like to talk about books that are young adult or middle grades as all ages. Um, any particular takeaways, any ideas that you'd like readers to be thinking about and exploring with you? I mean, it, every book is different and I feel like that's a, kind of the fun. And so for a book like Love in the Library, I'm really hoping that that, which is the true story of how my maternal grandparents met in a Japanese incarceration camp during World War II. I'm hoping that that opens up conversations with our youngest readers about the cruelty of racist policies and, you know, sort of the fact of them in our, not only in our nation's past, but in our nation's contemporary times as well. Um, but then I also wrote a picture book called Also an Octopus. That's just mm -hmm, a story about mm -hmm. how to tell stories. And I'm hoping mm -hmm. that kids take from it a license to tell their own stories and feel like they have ownership of that and that you don't have to be like a polished story wizard in order to be allowed to have that kind of fun. It's for everybody. Um, for Squad, you know, which is so much a revenge fantasy. Um, it's about teenage girls and werewolves and also rape culture. I hoped that teens, particularly who are suffering the brunt of rape culture, uh, would have a sense of catharsis reading that, oh. that it would be fun and it would feel nice to have their anger acknowledged and addressed and like, okay, basically, like it's okay to be angry about what is going on and it's okay to feel furious about it and to feel like there's nothing good and productive to be done with that anger that's okay you don't have not all of your feelings have to be channeled into something perfect and lovely it's okay to just be mad uh -huh, and uh -huh. with the mermaid the witch in the sea and the siren the song and the spy there's so much about finding your the, the power of finding your own identity and the power like how that unlocks your ability to love more effectively like it, once you know yourself then you can actually love because you know what it is that you are and you know what that means to be complimented. Mm -hmm. And I think um, those books are so much about finding your own place through love, like through loving someone, even if it's, you know, if it's your first love or it's an ex as happens in the second book or loving a sibling or a parent or your nation, whatever it is, finding who you are through that as being kind of like a healthy way of finding yourself um, and offering what I hope is like a wide variety of different ways that that can look like and having no single way be the correct way. So like, I don't know, every book totally different. And I think that's what's kind of fun about being across genres and across mediums and everything is you have that kind of room. You know, mm -hmm. Not every book needs to be revolutionary. Sometimes they're just there for fun or to make you curious about something. And I like the elasticity and freedom to just sort of channel whatever it is that I'm excited about in any given moment. Love it. I love the uh, the messages. I love the exploring that you do. And you mentioned um, the octopus. And so with your mm -hmm. permission, I'll use a ukulele uh, music effect to oh, introduce the podcast <laughs> and to, to close it out. I, I think that would be I would uh, love that. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. I I don't usually use the ukulele effect, but we will absolutely do that. Um, <laughs> you mentioned a little while ago that The Mermaid, The Witch, and the Sea is the first novel that you finished. So mm -hmm. I imagine that there are multiple manuscripts, pieces, ideas, parts of the journey, yeah. like like so many writers. Uh, I imagine that those are out there somewhere that you've spent time on ideas for a while. 
they're in the trash where they belong. Oh. <laughs> I have a <laughs> an unpopular opinion, which is that every time you write, you get better. So it's mm-hmm. never worth it to hold on to your old writing because you will remember everything that is good and most important. If you have a character you love, deleting the pages that they exist on won't make that character go away. You still have it all. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I, I delete projects all the time. I have... Yeah. It takes me about 20,000 words of walking, like writing in a novel for me to realize if it's like going to work or not, like if it's what's right for me. And Mm -hmm. so I have started, uh, I don't even know how many novels gotten about 20,000 words and have been like, well, that's (laughs) it. That's all folks. (laughs) And like just deleted it. Um, And that, that advice is not for everyone, but I have found that whenever I am copy pasting work, across documents uh i am being lazy like that it, i am not forcing myself to be a better writer and that writing always shows and uh-huh. so um so i don't do it anymore which is inefficient but <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wipe, but wiping right. the slate each time <laughs> yeah every time just blank canvas you got to start again you'll remember everything I remember everything that I like the most even particular turns of phrase or like ways that I was going to describe something if I really love it I'll find a way to make it fit something else yeah. you know without copy pasting it and it'll be better for not being copy pasted because it'll be more organically of the prose that it's coming out of Love it. I, I I really appreciate the the way you explain that and the foundation that you come from with it. I have had the experience of sitting down and writing something and thinking, oh, this is great. I can't believe I thought about this. And then finding somewhere the sort of the early scribblings from years ago, uh, forgetting, oh, that was somewhere else. So um, I, I, I appreciate the tabula rasa approach. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> And it seems to be working. Yeah. I mean, for me, it works. It doesn't work for everyone. I know like Mitali Perkins, who's like a National Book Award finalist and like a very accomplished author, saves every little bit of writing and has like documents on documents on documents. And that's what works for her. Mm -hmm. And that's great. So like clearly on both sides of the spectrum, like these, you can exist either way. For me, I do it this way because um, I like to force myself to like, one up myself every time if that makes sense like I'm Mm -hmm, always trying mm -hmm. to get better and I think for students it might be a healthy way to learn and then once you're at Mitali's stage you get to do whatever you want but like Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) but you know if you wrote something when you're in seventh grade you don't want to copy paste it into your 10th grade project right like you've already become smarter better at this you know even if it's a great idea like just steal your own idea and then rewrite it as your more mature and like practiced and seasoned self. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love the process. Now you're making me wonder how many 10th grade essays I've had turned in that are the results of (laughs) 7th grade essays that are salvaged up there. (laughs) Arguably all of education is that, right? Like we take each step forward. (laughs) It's a journey. It's a process. Yeah. Yeah. So any um, current events that you'd like to talk about? Sure. Um, Like you said, The Siren, The Song, and The Spy comes out on September 26th, as does uh, an anthology that I contributed to called Mermaids Don't Drown, which is edited by Zoraida Cordova and Natalie C. Parker, which has a short story that I wrote that I really love uh, called Shark Week in it. Um, and an anthology that's publishing in Australia called Everything Under the Moon, Fairy Tales Under a Queer Light. Um, But I think that you could probably wrangle in the States. It's all queer retellings of fairy tales, so I'm very excited to read it. And I'll be at the Idaho uh, Librarians Conference and the Enyal Fest, which is in Charleston, South Carolina, and some other events as well that are still kind of being hammered out. So it's just kind of got a busy few weeks ahead. Nice, nice, very nice. Um, so spaces where people can go to find out more, to follow your path, to continue to read as you explore. Yeah, I've been kind of not using social media as much anymore, but mm-hmm. um, 
I think like for updates, I'm still on Twitter at E-M-T-E-H-A-L-L. My website, Pretty OK Maggie, gets updated very sporadically. Um, and I'm on TikTok if you want to see me repost videos, because that's mostly what I do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, nice. <laughs> um, as Maggie Takuda Hall, but I took my Instagram private this year and I'm on Blue Sky, but it seems like not many people other than writers are on Blue Sky, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is fine. It's like still like has that kind of water cooler effect, but isn't as broad as Twitter is. Um, and that's Maggie Takuda Hall as well. Um, and like you said, my book, The Siren, The Song, and The Spy is out on the 26th. Very cool. It sounds like lots on the way. And it's certainly in the age of the internet, if someone wants a book that's only published in Australia, they can get it, right? I hope so. Yeah. Hope it so. looks really fancy, the version I've seen of it. The cover looks very nice and it has little spot illustrations. So it looks, I'm very excited to get my copy. Wonderful, wonderful. Do you do um, school visits and things like that? I do. And um, the contact form through my website is the best way to book those. Um, yeah, so I do virtual and in-person ones, but in-person ones are tougher to wrangle, as everyone might imagine. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Maggie. Did we miss anything that you want to make sure to mention at oh, the end no, of the episode? Yeah, thank you for the time. Not at all. Yeah. yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Glad to talk with you anytime and looking forward to the things that are to come. Great. Thank you so much for having me, Jason.